Hey, deserving listeners, we have a special guest on the podcast and YouTube channel today, Mark Rosenfeld. He is a dating and relationship coach from Australia. He's a fellow YouTuber, and he almost has half a million subscribers on YouTube, so he must be doing something right. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Hey, thanks, man. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I put to the channel on YouTube asking for questions from y'all to pose to Mark and to me, and we would answer them. There were so many questions, we're not going to get to all of them. <laughs> and if Literally I'm, 17 pages of questions. Yeah. And Incredible. If, yeah. And if I'm my normal uh, verbose self, we'll probably just get to one and a half questions. So let's get into it. <laughs> uh, what do you say, Mark? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Let's get straight in. All right. Taurus girl says, if someone appears to only attract unavailable men, quote unquote, what are some of the things that we need to work on within ourselves to find boyfriend material as opposed to guys who just want to hook up? I only seem to attract guys that just want to hook up. So how can Taurus girl attract available men as opposed to unavailable men? What are the things that they need to do and work on themselves to attract that? What do you think, Mark? Yeah, really good question. So I'd probably be first checking in for just context. Like, how are you meeting men at the moment, Taurus girl? Uh, is it online? Is it in person? And what's your sort of, are you just getting onto text? Are they just wanting sex from there? Um, usually the, the real key point is that, unfortunately, if you're, you're going to get a lot of attraction as a woman from guys that want sex a lot of the time. If you're wanting someone who's emotionally open, you've got to make sure that you're emotionally open yourself and that you're, you're being open to the possibility too. So things like if you're online getting to phone calls and showing that side of your personality, really being, being open and demonstrating that you're open yourself. Um, depending on what's happened in your past, you know, if I was working with you, what I'd probably look at is where specifically are you potentially shutting down? Like if you've had a few relationships in a row, I'd love to hear Kirk's thoughts on this as well, but if you've had a few relationships in a row where, for example, you've been totally shut down in your relationships where you haven't had the ability to speak up, you haven't had the ability to express yourself, then you're probably going to go through dating with, with similar fears of doing that. And when we really look at what you're doing, your actual expression of yourself is probably a little nullified. Uh, you could be doing subtle things like asking lots of questions is a common thing I see as opposed to making more statements, which you think it's a good thing because oh, I'm asking lots of questions, which means I get to know him. But when a guy's getting to know you, he's, he's listening to you, right? He wants to know you. He, he, needs, he needs to grab onto something in you to like. So sometimes we ask lots of questions to avoid talking about ourselves. And then we wonder why, oh, I'm doing most of the work in these conversations and guys are attracting, attracted to other girls. Um, so it sort of depends the way you're showing up and, and what specifically you're, you're doing that's making these unavailable guys come towards you. But typically, yeah, what I would find is that there's not as much self-expression. There's more focus on others. And the more that you really show up, the more that you share about yourself, the more you're on phone calls, the more you're making yourself available through your conversations, through talking about yourself, you're going to attract guys that love you for it and guys that don't will, will buzz off. There will always be a subset of guys who are just like, oh, let's come sleep with me. It'll be fun. Um, but rising to the surface, if your filtering skills are good, you should be getting a subset of guys who are like, yeah, you're a cool chick. I haven't met anyone like you. This is different. This is different. I want to get to know you better. Yeah, I like that. Uh, you're the only person that I've heard say something similar to what I've always been saying, which is that uh, you said, you know, give them something to grab onto, you know, that you show up in the relationship. I can't remember the exact words you, you were using, but yeah, I, I think about, I discovered this too. It's not something that's written about in the literature very much. I mean, they'll talk about a sense of self, a, you know, a lack of self, this kind of thing, which is mm -hmm. related for sure. And it's a whole deep topic I won't go into, but but when you are relationally traumatized growing up, made to feel like you don't matter, made to feel like you have to please other people, as, as Mark is alluding to, then you tend to like be very other focused and you ask a lot of questions and you don't insert your personality and who you are and your own needs 
And what that does is it creates a ghost that the other person is interacting with and they right. have nothing to grab onto. And they're just like, I don't know who this person is. I don't know what's going on with this person. And it might not even be conscious to the person you're dating. They might just be like, ah, she doesn't have personality or eh, no spark or, eh, you know, I don't know what's yeah, going on. Yeah, exactly. It's very vague. Right. Cause it's not like people are walking around going like, I hope people have a sense of self and I hope that their ego is doing it. You know, it's just more like, how do I feel when I'm interacting with this person? And when you're very other focused, you will tend to make other people feel like you don't exist really. And people want to interface with a human being who is like in the room, you know, that, you have a thing and you've got thoughts and you know one of the most common examples of this is like what do you want to do for the date today or what do you you know what kind of food do you or what movie do you want to see have at least a thought it doesn't mean you have to win the sort of debate but search and if you don't know what you want it could be because of traumas growing up and that's where the therapy begins because that can take a long time to develop that connection with who you are but that's where it comes down to. You just don't want to be like, well, you know, what answer do I need to say so that he will feel like I have an answer to it? <laughs> you know what I mean? You want yeah. to get in connection with, you know, your substance. And men can sense it. You know, if, if a man has three and this had happened vice versa as well, exactly the same in the other direction. But if a man has three women in front of him and, you know, one is talking about herself, she's, she's sharing what she loves. She's talking about tigers and the, the clowns or whatever she loves. It could be anything at all. A, a second is sort of in her head trying to say the right thing. And, and a third is asking a lot of questions and coming forward. Uh, the unfortunate reality is a, a lot of men will, will move towards the one that they can grab onto because, because they know her, that there's a human being, I can feel her. And men just get lit up by a woman's energy. Like we were talking about this on my channel. It just, men love a woman's energy. When, when you receive a man, when you respond to him, when he does something right and, and then you give him a smile or you give him a glance, it's just, it's like crack to a man. We, we love when a woman responds to us. So if she's responding and if she's got her own things, that just gives us a sense of her. And of course, now there's, there's other stuff on top of that. You've got to have your boundaries in place and other things. And, and you've got to have a, a certain level of standards for who you want to date. And then the man has to feel that you're willing to, you know, in the longer term, like, oh, I'm going to take this value. And if you're going to be just a casual, like, that's great. You can do that. But I'm going to go over here to a guy who's more serious. So a guy also has to feel that level of once you've established yourself and you know, you're solid in that the guy also usually has to feel a bit of pain of loss to really step up. But yeah, essentially what Kirk's saying, I a hundred percent agree with it's you can't grab onto a ghost you need a human and being available, showing up, sharing yourself, getting onto phone calls and then having that value around what you have to offer, knowing that it's uniquely you and that, Hey, you can choose someone else, but, you know, I'm going to choose someone who fully shows up for me. That's very powerful in an attractor. And, and men will step up to that. You'll find it's, it actually feeds out of you as well and back in. Yeah, exactly. Other things that I could think of, it's hard to know, Taurus girl, why you would only attract unavailable men. Uh, this is one thing. It could all just be bad luck as well. You know, I, I talk with a lot of people, they're like, you know, my whole life, I haven't met the right person. I'm like, how old are you? Like, I'm 22. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you, you know, give it some time, my friend. Like, uh, sometimes you're looking in the wrong places, you know, to, you know, think about take an inventory of like where you're looking. Also, there's predictive identification, which I talk about in terms of we, long story short, we will tend to recreate our past relationships. So if you had an unavailable parent, we will rep through repetition compulsion, um, accidentally and subconsciously recreate that. We'll find that person who subconsciously, or, oh, I bet you that person is like my dad who abandoned me when I was a kid. And you won't pick up on it, but you'll be very attracted to that person. And until you heal through therapy, usually it's going to be hard not to be attracted to those people because there's a there's an extreme compulsion to be like, I must create the past so that I can make it better this time. The problem is the subconscious isn't very good at knowing which situations to recreate that will likely go better this time and provide a corrective experience and which will likely be repeated and thus re-traumatize us and causing us more damage, you know, to our idea. Yeah. Our, our brains are such big fans of the devil. We know that, yeah. that we tend to yeah. go into the same thing again and again. And it, it's weird when you're, you know, if you haven't had someone who's fully emotionally available, someone who's fully there and, and you put that person 
in front of you, it'll be, it'll be almost foreign. Like it's a new experience to get your nervous system used to someone who's fully emotionally available there. It'd be very vulnerable, quite scary. Uh, as you say, Kirk, if you've, if you've been used to the game growing up, like does this person like me, do, do they not? Then as weird as it is that that game is comfortable for you and, and you, you know it, you can keep playing it. Right. Um, I wanted to add in as well, just sometimes around high school, stuff, stuff can come up in high school, which is, which is to say that if you've been the type where you had wounds coming through from high school as well, I'd be curious to know if you find this, where you're kind of going, mm, gee, I'd always want to date the popular person. I'd always want to, I want to date that, that amazing person. And so often in high school, we, that's our thought, right? We're like, oh, if I could just date that person, I'd get so much social currency. Um, sometimes those wounds play out as well in adulthood, which is we get very focused on a sort of a, a social currency exchange person, someone who represents the person we could never date at high school. I know because I did this. And then we wonder why we keep attracting that because we're sort of trying to make up for high school wounds rather than actually find someone that, that truly connects with us. And of course, when you're just transacting social currency through someone, you tend not to have the best relationships from that. So something like that could be going on as well. I do see that with clients. Yeah, absolutely. Our traumas don't just happen in our families. They can absolutely happen at schools. Absolutely. Uh, Megan says, in my dating history, I've always cared about my partners much more intensely than they did about me. And then she talks about how she quickly wants to hang out all the time with her partners. And they, you know, very like within a few days, she's just like, I want to see you all the time. And they're just like, um, you know, not so much. And she's like, I don't know what's wrong with me. What do you think, Mark? What, what, see, she's not really asking a question so much as like, I'm guessing what she's asking is like, how do I not do that? One thing I like to help clients do is just reframe their standards a little bit. So really start to think of what do I want on a longer term scale? Like, like what are some, cause society, it focuses so much just on certain traits. Like, oh, if the person's, you know, a, a lawyer or if they have money or if they're tall or, or whatever it is. And, and we see someone and then we go on a first date and we're like, they're also kind and they're attractive and they love puppies. Like it's the perfect person. And then we get, this is my person. And then we go to this fantasy where we're married and where, you know, all our, all our freaking wounds are ticked off and like, hey. And, and so the first thing I'd say is just reframe a little bit some of your standards so that you can think of things that you're never going to see on a first date. Mm. Like, like true relationship qualities is like, how does someone treat me when they're really stressed out? You know, can he still respect me during an argument? Uh, is he going to accept my nose and, and have healthy boundaries with me? So, so I like to use a saying, you know, someone can be 10 out of 10 on the first date, but they're 10 out of 100 overall. So really lengthening out those standards just to think, okay, I know what a relationship takes, like what a true healthy relationship takes. Get out of this idea that it's like the high school, if I just tick all the boxes on the first date, that's it. Oh, I'm high as a kite on the fantasy. Okay, let's, let's drop the fantasy a little bit and look at what real relationships entail. And it's not stuff you're going to see on the first date. Uh, the question was also about how uh, I find myself being very anxious, kind of like we were talking about before, Megan, I would just check in. Uh, one skill that I work on a lot of clients with is receiving. And if you're in more of a doer mindset, if, and, and it seems like a lot of girls in our generation were raised this way and also in the generation X and sort of above me were raised this way where it's like, you're good if you're helping out, you're good if you're doing things for other people. Oh, that, that's like such a loving thing that you did. There's so much doing energy that receiving is not something you're in control of the way you're in control of giving, right? When, when you're giving, you're in control. I can give a present to you and you usually say something nice back. Like I'm in direct control of the needs returning to me. Whereas true receiving, you know, you don't control when your birthday is, right? People just, you just receive from people and it's not weird. You're just like, yeah, I'm just awesome. It's my birthday and everyone loves me and gives me stuff. And I, I, I owe the world nothing. But taking that attitude into your relationships and, and sitting with the discomfort and the risk of that can be very scary if you've got kind of the do -er, I need to do, I need to focus on you mindset. So being able to lean back and receive it, again, it makes you vulnerable because you don't know if that gift's going to come. And probably as a kid, if you're a big doer, that gift never came. And it was a huge amount of anxiety. So that's why you became a doer. So slowly training yourself to receive and just say, I'm not going to be the doer. I'm going to filter in the men who 
want to give and then I'm going to receive and respond and encourage that behavior and reward it. Uh, but I'm not going to do all the work. Like I'm going to set a boundary, draw a line in the sand where I say, do you know what? I have enough value. I, I'm allowed to receive. And yeah, some, some guys you really like will, will buzz off because of that. And that will bring stuff up for you. That'll bring up some uncomfortable emotions you have to deal with. But when you do, you'll filter in the ones that, that want to give so you can receive and you'll feel a million times better about yourself and the relationship. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. The only thing I'll add to your question, Megan, is, so you're saying, you know, that you very quickly will say, you know, boom, I want to date this person a lot, right, right from the start. And they're just like, well, you know, let's take it slower. Uh, one, it's possible that you're just meeting people that are just incompatible with you. There's nothing wrong with wanting to dive head first into love. There's pros and cons to that, obviously, but it's not an inherent dysfunction to say like, I really like this person. Let's spend the next you know, two months together, nonstop, you know, that will pathologize that, but why? I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. Now, there could be something wrong with it, but there's not something inherently wrong. Second thing is, is that preoccupied attachment, you know, when you are mistreated growing up and you decide I have to lean in, I have to be the doer as what Mark is saying. I have to be the one that gives and constantly, you know, sort of manages and controls relationships to keep people close to me. Otherwise they're going to fly away from me then it creates a lot of anxiety when it's in between date two and three, you know, there's like, you know, it's not uncommon to have a few yeah, days. Dude. Yeah. To have a few yeah. days between or a week between two and three or something. And there's that anxiety of like, well, what if he flies away from me? What, if, what if that happens? And being able to know yourself, know your emotions, know your attachment and security, get healing around that will cause less anxiety in that situation. So you can be more flexible around that. But I don't know your situation precisely, Megan, but just based on your questions, those are some suggestions I'd throw out there. Yeah. I was going to say, it's a great opportunity to self-soothe because I mean, you know, logically that, well, I was just single. I've only been on two dates, so I know I'm going to be okay. Single. If we get in a relationship, that's great too. So it's just sort of that unstable area in the middle that's triggering some of that stuff. So as, as we were saying, Dr. Kirk and I were saying on my channel as well, when, when you have those opportunities and you are around men, that could be one of those opportunities where you say, okay, it's between take day two and three. You know, I'm going to take 24 hours just to notice what's coming up for me mm. and to just sort of sit with that really uncomfortable emotion and, and handle it. And, and the more you actually handle it, and I'm, love to know if you agree Kurt but the more you handle usually those emotions underneath the anxiety the more you actually self-soothe and teach yourself that hey I'm going to be okay I can handle this uh, I can trust the men that want to to come towards me and if someone doesn't that's not going to be my person yeah you agree? 100% and I would add that uh, reach out to your friends spend time with them you know if you're having you know do the self-soothing you know reassure yourself as Mark is saying notice your feelings, be okay with that, accept that, and hang out with other people. Uh, that, that could help. All right, uh, Ms. Jess says to Mark and me, what to say when initiating conversations on Bumble is asking, how are you doing appealing enough? I personally, like it. Uh, <laughs> I personally like it when someone genuinely asks how I am. Interacting online for me is completely different than in person for me, what are some best practices when trying to get a conversation going on Bumble? So what do you think, Mark? Yeah, great question. So it's the same as a bar, which is, would you walk up to someone directly and say, how are you doing? You could maybe, but it would be unusual. It'd be like, wait a minute, who are you? You know, it's the other thing about questions is you're asking for an investment from the other person when you haven't shared anything of yourself yet. Mm -hmm. You're saying, okay, invest in me. And the other person's like, well, hang on. Who are you? Uh, now, sometimes as a girl, you can get away with it as a woman. But what I really recommend, as Kirk is saying earlier, is share something about yourself. And it doesn't have to be anything major whatsoever. Um, a small statement does, a gr does the trick perfectly. But, you know, you look over his profile, hopefully he's got a couple of written lines. If a guy hasn't even written a profile, it probably says he's not putting that much effort in. So he's got a couple of written lines, a couple of photos. All you need to do is say something small that relates to that. Uh, I have the cutest cat that looks just like that one. Um, oh my God, you've been to Thailand. I went there and this happened. Some little statement that adds energy. Uh, you know, if he's got a picture of himself at SeaWorld, you're like, I went to SeaWorld two years ago. And it was the best trip. A statement that adds energy. That's a bit of a share because you've shared a little couple little trinkets there. 
uh, which he can then grab onto and relate back to. And if you think about it at a bar, you know, it's typically much socially smoother if, if you walk up to someone and, and you're next to them and you legitimately notice something, you're like, is that bracelet from Croatia? Like, actually, yes, we went there. We had this holiday in split stayed There was a backpacker, saw the beautiful, this beautiful garden. You're like, oh my God, I went to a similar garden in Vienna. When we're in Vienna, we did this thing and this thing, went to Spanish riding school. No way, you like horses? I love horses, blah, blah, blah. And notice no one's asked a question, right? It's, I'm making a statement. Oh, I can relate to that statement. Here's a statement about me. Oh, I can relate to that statement too, statement about me. So any little statement shares uh, are very powerful for sharing energy. And that's if you watch people who meet in a bar really spontaneously and they're like, we just hit it off. It was incredible. It's usually not kicked off by questions. Questions come a little later when people want to go deeper. But when someone's sharing a statement, they're putting in the effort and giving the other person the opportunity to relate. Yeah, I really like that. It's not really my area. A lot of clients don't really ask me that sort of specific thing. So that's more your area, Mark. So I'll, I'll default to your answer on that. It makes sense. Do Touch says, how can I better tell the difference between asking for what I need versus being bossy. My long-term partner Ooh, thinks my, <laughs> my long-term partner thinks my communication style needs work. Mark, what do you think? Well, there's a, there's a big myth and we have such a shame on needs and people being quote unquote needy, right? It's like, it's like a, such a bad thing. Everyone's like, Oh, you're needy. Don't be needy. It's such a shameful thing. Yeah. What people don't realize is that needs do not cause neediness. This is very important. Needs do not cause neediness. Needs are human, right? Needs are natural. What happens though is sometimes people with needs use control or manipulative language and the person feels like, well, do I even get a choice? What, what happened to my freedom? Uh, if I have a need and I have a need for a hug and I say, you should be a better girlfriend, you need to hug me more. You're a bad girlfriend because you're not giving me enough attention, right? The other person's like, well, wait a minute why am I being controlled here? Mm -hmm. And so the neediness and the control controlling request to get the needs met get mishmashed together. And suddenly this person feels all controlled and says, well, you're needy, but it's, it's not the needs. It's, it's the fact that you're not being vulnerable in your expression of the needs and you're not giving the other person the freedom of choice if they want to meet them or not. If I say, Hey, can I be super open with you? Can I be honest with you? And my partner's like, yeah, sure. I'm like, Hey, I've been feeling like a bit sad and a bit disconnected and, if you were open to it, a, a hug would feel amazing right now. It would mean a lot to me if we could maybe even just sit for like five minutes, if that'd be something you'd be open to, it would just really mean a lot to me and make me feel really good. Uh, and that gives the person the opportunity to choose. And it's very rare a human being when you're that vulnerable is going to, to move away from you. And, and, you know, if they do, that's, that's another signal that maybe you are someone who has their own shame around the needs, et cetera. And that may not be your person, but, it's the, it's the way you request the needs. If, if, if you're being interpreted as bossy, then probably, I can't say for sure, because sometimes you can say it the perfect way and the person will still be like, oh, you're being so bossy, don't guilt trip me. So that, that can be a thing. But generally speaking, if you bring real vulnerability and you really show how you feel, the person's A, not going to see you as needy or bossy, and B, they're going to want to meet those needs. Yeah. Do you agree? hundred percent music to my ears, Mark. I couldn't have said it better myself. So I'm just going to let that be. And uh, I've said it. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've said what you just said to people. <laughs> just like, uh, so that was great. Yeah. Uh, a different Megan says, so I have a friend. Uh, it's really a friend, LOL, who has a boyfriend. Every time they get in an argument, he breaks up with her. Most of the time, the issues are small and trivial, and every time he regrets breaking up and they get back together. My question is, what would make someone go to the default of breaking up every time they hit a snag? How can they stop this cycle? Mark, what do you think? Uh, fear, a lot of fear coming through. It's, it's not a great pattern, that one when I hear it. It's, oh, every time I feel there's a little tension, I have to run to the other side of the room, basically. So that says to me that that person's very uncomfortable with kind of disagreement. They probably have real fears around confrontation. Maybe as a kid, every time they spoke about their needs, they were like, you need to agree with me or I'm going to go over here and you're a bad boy. So he's just like, well, frick, I'm going to run to the other side of the room every time there's like even a little disconnect. 
that's going to be uh, some work for, for both of you, but, but particularly for him just to sit through that and feel safe that there can be a disagreement and it's not going to lead to abandonment and he doesn't have to pull the trigger, you know, on getting out of here. Um, yeah, it, it's a scary pattern because for you as well on the other end of it, it, it trains you to sort of silence yourself because, well, every time I maybe speak up, is he going to run off again? And so, well, I'm going to step on tiptoes right now and walk on eggshells. And that's going to be really scary for you as well. So it's, as it, my man's there's, there's a saying that uh, you can smash a plate once, put it back together, but the more times you smash it, it just becomes dust. So I would, I would definitely be uh, asking for professional help with that because it sounds like there's a lot of fear on his end and it's going to lead to a lot of fear on yours as well. Yeah. More music to my ears, Mark. I can see why people love your YouTube channel because you're a very wise, a very wise fella. Yeah, exactly. I've treated couples like this before and, and people who, because they're early childhood trauma, as you're talking about, Mark, they are terrified of vulnerability, of it. They're preemptively leaving the other person because they are certain they're going to be left. And so, or there's going to be something terrible that's going to happen, some terrible guilt trip, or there's just something terrible that's about to happen. And so run away. But mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's like, you really want to learn how to do the high dive and you're like on the, at the pool, you know, and you're just like, okay, I'm going to go do it. And then you get up there and you, and you're like, oh, and you run away, but then you get down off the high dive. Oh, but I really want to learn how to do the high dive because that's, this is my big goal in life. I want to jump off that. You get back up oh, and you run away. So that's what's happening is, is he really wants to get close. He really wants to have a relationship, but when he gets so close and so close to the, to the action that causes him to have that terror reminded, you know, those traumas were triggered. It's run, run, run. And he's so flooded with emotion it makes sense to him in the moment. Admit, you know, if you ask him, are you, cause I've worked with people like this before. It's actually kind of bizarre in a way you'll ask them in the moment. And we're, by moment, I mean like weeks, I'll just be like, so are you sure that this is what you want to do? You want a divorce? You want to leave hundred percent. I know I've retracted my decision before, but no, this is the time. Fast forward six months. They're like, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I was in a completely weird mindset at the time. I love her. I want to go back to her. And, and that fear is overwhelming. You know, trauma is no joke. So, you know, as, as Mark is saying, obviously getting ther therapy is a good thing. And really for all the things we're talking about. Um, it's sort of pendulum between two fears, isn't it? It's like the, the fear of closeness comes up and then the fear of loneliness comes up. And I, I see this yeah. all the time with women who come to me. They say, I can't figure out his behavior. He's hot and he's cold. He says he really connects to me. And in the moment, if it's so real, I know he's not lying. Then he doesn't text me for three weeks. Or then he's like, oh, I don't know. I'm a bit unsure. And it's literally those two fears, fear of connection. I get too close close, fear of loneliness, I get away from you. And, and as Kirk says, it's like the person means what they say in the moment. Like they really genuinely believe it. And, but you've got to sort of look at their behavior overall and say, okay, what are their fears here? Uh, and usually the solution is, is to put a boundary around it, which is to say, okay, you, you can't be floating back and forth. Like it's emotionally hurting me because you're like, you're in and then you're not. I'm getting emotionally crippled by this, like line in the sand, backed up with actions. You're either in this and you're going to confront your fears of closeness or you're moving away from me. We're doing three months, no contact, and you're going to deal with your fears of loneliness and I'm, we're not going to text. Like you can't keep oscillating between the two. You're either in this with me or you're not. Either is okay. I want to be here with you. I really love you. I want to connect with you, but I'm not going to be emotionally pulled back and forwards by you going between these two fears. Yeah. To have a compassionate conceptualization of someone like this does not compel you to put up with it. So uh, that's up to you. It could be a deal breaker. And um, yeah, Sandy ha has a great question says, mm -hmm. so the best dating coach, isn't that guy from 90 day fiance. So <laughs> I, I, I don't know Ash you... has a reputation. Oh, so do you know Ash? <laughs> I, I only saw your review of it. So that's all I've, oh, 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 and my partner's like, there's this guy on my dear fiance, but pretty much all I know is from your okay. cringe review. Because Ash on 90 Day Fiance is living in Australia and is a dating and relationship coach. And so, uh, you know, obviously Australia is a big place, but, uh, and you don't watch 
90 Day Fiance, but I just wondered if you bumped into each other on Instagram or something. I've never, never heard of anything other than what I've seen on your video. Okay. That's all I know of him. <laughs> Uh, uh, Osiris uh, and Honeybee both on YouTube asked this similar question, which is what are the biggest red flags to look out for within the first few weeks of dating someone? Mark, what do you think? This is more your area. Yeah, there's, there's a few different ones and it sort of, it sort of depends what you've had in the past because it's all depending on your, um, yeah, what you've dated in the past, the way your relationships have been, you'll have a different series. Um, obviously people who are, strictly out for sex and not taking no's in that area. Um, people who are moving faster than you are comfortable moving, and this is important, are not slowing down when you request. Um, so if someone's really wanting to go fast and really kind of just, just sort of future projecting a lot and saying like all this stuff, and, and you can just feel it when it's more of a let's get high together, let's get romantic, then a genuine, actually, I really want to take you to this place in two weeks. Like, this is going to be super fun. You know, like, that's much more normal, right? It's like, yeah, I want to do this with you, as opposed to like, oh, it'd be so great. You know, I want to do this with you in the future and this. Um, love bombers will sort of see if they can wrap you into their dopamine chemistry pool. And, and if you allow it, what it can do very easily is collapse your own boundaries and have you just so into that person that you forget to take things at your own pace and you forget to, or you start to feel bad saying no, or, oh, he did this for me, so now I should do this for him. So I definitely say any of that sort of pressure behavior, any gaslighting behavior where you start to really doubt yourself, or you should always be feeling better and more confident and, and more secure about yourself with a person not to the point where it's addictive, but to the point where you're like, yeah, I feel good around this person. Um, you know, more and more, I'm really just having women connect with their intuition and they always know, you know, if I, if I talk to a woman, I'm like, okay, what does your intuition tell you here? Uh, is this like a safe, healthy guy? Or is this someone who has other intents, who is being a bit avoidant? if you're getting that intuition, like more and more, I find that women know it's just stopping and actually listening to it. That that's the big thing. Um, obviously things like, you know, he's super warm when he's around you and it's great. And then you don't hear from it for like a week. Like, that's just weird. Like who that's not normal human connection. If you really like someone, you talk to them most days. That's just, that's just normal. If someone's like always gone at weird times, if someone's just being sort of shifty with their language. Obviously, if they're saying they're going to do things and they're not doing them, any disconnect between words and actions, you can search for all of these things. But yeah, more and more, I'm, I'm encouraging clients like listen to, to listen to your gut. And if this is a really healthy, solid, stable guy where you're just getting a bit nervous because maybe he's um, maybe he is emotionally available and you're not used to that and he just just likes you, then listen to that intuition. If something feels off to you, also listen to that intuition. And, and if you're in a little bit of doubt, uh, go on one or two more dates and get more information for your intuition. You know, you can, you can cut him off at any point. So if, if you're just like, oh, I've been on two dates, I don't know, Mark. Okay, go on your third, get more information to your intuition, come back to me and tell me how it feels for you. Uh, and obviously there's lots of background knowledge on things narcissists do and controlling behavior, that sort of stuff. And you can watch more videos on that. But yeah, more and more, I'm just finding when clients really listen to their intuition, they can spot a lot of this stuff. Mm. Yeah, I like it. Uh, strawberry shortcake for life. This will be our final question, I think. Mm. Um, how to handle red pill men and their, oh, their, God. their growing hate club. It's so scary that there are so many YouTube channels and podcasts who are supporting the red pill propaganda Single, like, for example, single moms are just a bunch of users and gold diggers. Women, once past the age of 30, are dispensable. A lot of women don't mind being cheated on as long as they're not told, as long as they're not told about the cheating. Uh, never let your wives handle your finances. Wives tend to cheat when there is no chaos at home to distract them. Mark, what do you think? Oh, it just, it just makes me sad, all this stuff. But, but honestly, I don't give it much of my attention. I think it's related to to MGTOW and men doing their own thing. And I think there's a women version as well. It, it's basically, let's call a spade a spade. It's, it's men who have been hurt by women getting away from women and women who have been hurt by men getting away from men. Uh, honestly, I'm a real believer that most of the problems and dramas in our society come 
because someone wasn't admitting, wasn't willing to admit they felt unloved. Mm. And, and that is basically a chronic presentation of, and look, it probably comes from culture as well. Men haven't been encouraged to share their emotions and feelings and no one, you know, goes 20 years into a divorce and then gets totally screwed over, loses half their stuff. And then, Oh, my wife caused all this drama. You know, that drama started a decade earlier when someone was feeling unloved and wasn't willing to admit it. And then it sort of festers and grows for 10 years and then it all comes out at the end. And the result is people are so hurt from just chronically feeling unloved that they pull away and make up stories about how bad the other gender is. Um, the, the truth is, you know, men need women, women need men with women are just so important and, and fundamental to our lives. Like it's absurd to say anything else and the same for men to women. And so these, unfortunately, these groups just, just share their own hurt and, and they have a space for that. And, you know, it's not that their hurt is invalid, but they do make up stories about it and propagate it. And it's just not, it's just not human. It's, it's not truth. I mean, it's probably truth in their perception, but I mean, what are you, what, what are you going to do? Put, put your eyes on the one, 2% corner of society that, that don't share your beliefs or just say, okay, they're over there doing their thing. They'll either get over their hurt or they won't, but yeah, I just, I, I don't give it any attention to be honest, because it's just people who are feeling unloved and hurt. Yeah. hundred percent. I first discovered this years ago with clients, clients would come to me who were sort of proto, you know, like before red pill began it, they, this is, you know, 15 years ago. And I started noticing this tendency. And then when the internet came along, it's kind of fed into it. And I saw MGTOW, the, also the pickup artist community, uh, all these different things are, they're, they're essentially cults, if you will, or groups that are answers to people's questions. They are, they feel in love, they feel rejected and they don't know what to do. And they're isolated. They're sitting at home they go to the computer. Well, there, there's a, you know, for people like Mark and me, we're like, well, it's complicated. You know, it sucks to feel unloved and we don't really have any easy answers to that. You know, we, we can provide some tips and this sort of thing. We're like, well, yeah, but there are easy answers on the internet. Red pill, MGTOW, incel, uh, pickup artist community, they provide very convenient answers. It's not you. It's feminism. It's not you. It's women. <laughs> it's not you. It's our society turning into a bunch of pussies. That's what's happening right now. And it's, it has a sort of a, they always like put a little bit of thread of truth in there and then expand into this just ridiculousness. And it feels better. You walk away after interacting with that going like, oh, I feel less shame now. And plus, I also feel this like tribe of people are speaking, yeah, my, connected. Yeah, speaking my language and, and they're giving me like tools and they, they, they say they work and all this kind of stuff. I made episodes about this. I actually um, made one episode to trick MGTOW people into watching. I, I titled it How to Meet Women. <laughs> right. And a lot of, you know, these incel red pill people would click on it. And it was me interacting with a listener who was being sucked into that world and how I essentially helped them to extract themselves from the cult, you know, and, and give them a path forward and validate their yeah, feelings wow. of, of hurt, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And so since I've been doing this podcast, I've interacted with a lot of these people. It's like trying to get someone not to fall into a cult. It really is like that. Mm. And, it, and, but staying connected, you know, and they'll throw stuff out there, but they'll be like, but Kirk, you know, what about this? And what about that? And I'll be like, okay, let's talk about that. You know, there's, there's a thread of truth there, but the way your internet corner is expanding on that, that's, that leads to a path of destruction. It's not even empirically true. So you say strawberry shortcake, you know, how do I handle red pill men? Well, if they're just friends, you know, try to stay in contact with them because you're essentially trying to prevent them from falling into a, dis a destructive cult for themselves. But then if you're asking like, how do I date someone like that? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, I would never want to date a, a wig tail woman just because she sees men as the enemy. And so I'm going to go to women who appreciate men and, and love men for for being men and I'm going to feel much more at home there. Yeah. So if you meet a red pill, a red pill man, um, you know, you're up against a big barrier to all sorts of things. 
is it possible to convince him otherwise and to connect with his pain so he doesn't have to turn to the cult to help him out? Certainly. But, you know, you got to pick your battles and know your own. What's the bloke's name who, um, the, the black guy who went to the KKK rallies? I forget his name, but yeah, that, mm. I, yeah, I love that guy. A very inspirational story. Yeah. He, uh, for those listeners that, that don't know, he, he went along to KKK rallies and he said, you know, I don't agree with a lot of these ideas, but I'm going to show respect. I'm going to listen. And that's really hard. You know, it'd be super triggering for, for most black people, obviously, to go to those rallies. Uh, but I think more than 200,000 Ku Klux Klan members gave up their clannage because this guy was just such a, such an opposite to their belief. You know, how can you, how can you reality or how can you like hold on to a belief that these people are bad and disrespectful when you've got one here who's being so respectful? It's just a total dissonance. And for so many people, he collapsed their beliefs. So in the friend situation, you know, if you could play that role where you're just like, I'm just going to be like a great woman, my best self. And if you can genuinely not be triggered by that, uh, it just creates dissidence for, for red pill people who are telling these stories of how bad women are. And it's like, I have this friend, she's not like any of these things. And it just creates that dissonance and doubt. So you could take that attitude. That is a rare story, but an incredible one. Uh, but yeah, dating would be a different, a different thing. It's just, yeah, no. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll end there. Mark, thanks for coming on the podcast. If people want to check you out, they can go to Mark Rosen, Rosenfeld. Uh, right. Yeah. Rosenfeld. On YouTube. On, yeah. On, on makehimyours.com. And, and what was that? Makehimyours.com. You can check out my book, which is there as well. Okay. And your podcast is called Make Him Yours? Uh, make Love Yours is the make, podcast. Make Love Yours. Yeah. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.